Welcome. Today we're going to talk about uh, production optimization. And what I will be presenting here is um, to give you a, a brief introduction to, to this topic, which is quite large and has uh, so a lot of uh, sub uh, areas and topics. Uh, so my main intention is to make you aware of, to give you an introduction and also to look into some some problems and then also make you aware a bit of the methods that are available and uh, at the end I th I, we are going to make an exercise okay, to give you and I, I give you some uh, uh, comments about um, some issues that we might experience. Uh, this, this part uh, you can find um, most of it is taken from chapter three of my compendium. So if you need to, uh, you need some reference material, you can get it from there. Okay, so uh, production optimization, what it is, what is it? Um, we are going to talk, I want you to be aware of the general term, how is it handled, how it is uh, used in the industry, what does it refer to. Optimization, if we talk about mathematical or programming or simulation, in optimis in a simulation, it's uh, it means something very, very specific. But in the oil and gas industry, actually, it involves a series of activities that all of them kind of give the same outcome, the same result. Okay. So I'm going to go through the, that list and just go through some examples. So the first one is to detect and identify locations in the system that you have abnormally high pressure loss and flow restriction. If we like we uh, if we make our our well, okay, let's make our even if it's in red. Okay, we have then finally we end up in a separator. Okay, some place. Okay. So flow is is actually it's the the amount of flow that you can produce from PR to P separator, as we have discussed multiple times before. It, it depends on the, the pressure drop that you have between PR, this the source, well, we say the source node, and the, and the destination, okay, the P separator. So typically you have, like if you are, were going to plot this pressure with distance, okay, the pressure along X, okay, and this X we say it's along from, from the reservoir, okay, Maybe we should make it from here, zero, then goes all the way here, and then you can continue until you reach the separator. Okay, you see that you are going to go from PR and it's being reduced. Let me use another color. Okay, so for example, you have the drawdown then you have the tubing losses, then you have the flow line losses, and then finally you reach the separator. Okay. And this is what we call, in our case, okay, we can have some other cases, but we have the drawdown. Okay, we have, this is the, the tubing. This is the flow line, delta P. What I painted here, it might be that, um, so you first have to look what we have discussed previously. We have to say which part is dominating. Where can you, where can you um, make, um, uh, where, where can you uh, reduce this delta P, okay? And another thing is to look for places where I have an abnormally high delta P. Okay, so for example, if we look here, maybe close to the separator, we have some component which has excessive delta P. 
Okay? Or if we look at the flow line, maybe it has an excessive delta P compared to the rest of the system. Okay? And it might be because of several reasons. But some of the reasons are the design, the diameter, for example, that I use for this pipe is too small. Okay, so then I, if I increase the diameter by a change in design, then I will be able to reduce the pressure drop in that component. Okay, that happens typically, uh, well, everywhere but tubing, happens in flow line, happens also in the headers of the, of the um, top side facilities. It might also be that you have an increase, so it could be, uh, uh, so wrong design, okay wrongly designed okay so for example we are going to talk about the diameter of tubing okay of pipe etc it might be that i have something is causing the reducing the cross section with time and you can see that if you're monitoring uh, you can see that for example the delta p starts to increase with time so then you might have, for example, wax, you might have scale, okay? you might have um, some, some sort of accumulation, you might have sand. Okay? So if that's like, um, like a, a simple measure that you can make and you are going to increase production, okay? at the end the result is essentially increasing production. Okay. Some other measure other measures is verification of equipment design conditions versus actual operating conditions. Like in our case that was our compressor, our subsea compressor. Okay. And you see that we want to be operating first, it has to be designed for these operational conditions. Okay, it has to be designed for these blue dots that I have here. And that's the operational map of the compressor. Okay, in polytropic head and the floor, actual flow rate at the inlet of the compressor. So you want that first these points will be inside your operational region. Okay, here they are a bit on the to the on the extreme. Okay, that means that any reduction I make I will be out. And equipment, I, I don't want to operate it outside of the, the, their design range. Okay, first because I have it can cause operational problems, more um, frequent failure, but also the efficiency of this uh, of this equipment will be if I'm I want to operate at the point of the best efficiency. Okay, so that happens with rotating equipment, happens with chokes, happens with. Uh, gas lift valves happens with uh, even separators so top side top side equipment <clears throat> some other things are to identify and address fluid sources that have some sort of disadvantages characteristics um, or non-attractive characteristics like could be a gas if you are a bit constrained with gas and you want to identify the sources of high gas okay which wells are high gas producers water producers H2S, etc. And maybe do something about it. If you are, have a constraint, then you can reduce the production from these wells, and then that allows you to increase from other wells. Okay. Identify and correct system malfunctions and unint unintended behavior. Um, if you have something, a common failure that happens that disrupts your, your production, for example, uh, an alarm that is triggering and then you have to do some sort of shutdown of your plant and it takes a long time to put it back on online so then you want to see why that alarm is happening and uh, and try to address the reason if it's a poorly set a poorly set set point uh, if it's a real alarm maybe you can change the equipment have it related to the previous point okay Another point is to analyze and improve the logistics and planning of maintenance, replacement, and installation of equipment, or in the execution of field activities. Okay, if, if, for example, one equipment breaks down and you don't have the part in, in storage, then you have to wait a long time for it to come. Okay, but if you know that you will have some component that will need to be replaced with certain frequency, you can optimize or you can effectivize uh, the um, the uh, 
like the, getting that part. Okay, also execution of field activities. I have to do measurements, for example, every once in a while, so I I can make the logistics optimal such that, for example, I do other things at the same time. I not only do to go to do some tests or do some repairs, but I, I also try to do many things at the same time. So I reduce, for example, crew, crew time, I reduce expenses, I reduce trips okay, to the platform. <clears throat> Then review the occurrence of failures and recognize patterns. For example, and that's what I put here, this uh, fancy and trendy words like data analytics. But essentially, if I see that some failure is happening, try to correlate that with some operational condition. Okay? For example, I was involved in a, in a project that had a pump and uh, the pump, uh, one pump was failing more often than the other. And it turned out that uh, one pump was always operating at a higher speed than the other. Okay, so the speed was uh, correlated somehow with the rate failure rate of, of that pump. Okay, and after you recognize that trend, then you can take some measures. You can, for example, share uh, to in the case of the pumps, if they were operating at different speeds, you can simply put both of them trying to keep them at the same speed, such that not only one is working more than the other. Okay, calibration of instrumentation. Uh, we trust very much uh, on the values that come out of these instruments. Okay, when you say that you are obtaining certain rate or a certain uh, pressure, but these these instruments can be often uh, not uh, not calibrated okay so you might give me a wrong reading so i might think i have a problem or i might think things are doing fine but actually i have a problem but the instrumentation is not calibrated uh, identific identification of operational constraints like uh, for example water handling capacity power capacity gas processing capacity and not only when they are bottlenecked that's when they are restricting your production. But beforehand, you know what are the capacities or what are the constraints or what are the maximum values of different things. Because that allows you to, to when you're designing, making your planning for the future, that allows you to recognize some um, constraints or some bottlenecks that you might face. Okay, For example, if you're planning an expansion, and you need some more power, you have to be aware how much power you have in your gas turbine top side, and you you know how you know if that's going to be a bottleneck or not, depending on the equipment you want to install. <clears throat> Observe and analyze the response of the system when changes are introduced. It's um, it simply here is related, this comment is related to uh, you have some idea that some phenomena are related. Okay, like you you are see some behavior in one well and then you try to see uh, for example you see um, some behavior in a pro pro production well and you suspect that has to do with some injector well okay so then you do a test you do a change in the injector and you see if that reflects in the producer okay so for example if you have several injectors around one producer but then you make changes in the injectors you try to see which one either has the greatest impact or if they have any impact at all. Okay, because maybe there are some measures you can take on those injectors that have the most um, the most effect on the producer. Okay. I'm going to skip over these two, but identify a bottleneck is related to the one that I mentioned before. If something is bottlenecking, you have to discover what it is, gas rate, water rate, H2S content, CO2, um, sand production, uh, formation stability, okay? and also identifying and monitoring uh, key performance in, uh, performance indicators, okay, or KPIs. And then comes the actual, the the most uh, rigorously speaking, the most the best definition of production optimization, okay, which is to find control settings of equipment or system characteristics that give a production higher than current, okay, but preferably that gives maximum production possible. That actually is, is the, the right definition of production optimization. But the industry 
has all of these activities I mentioned before under the umbrella of production optimization. But essentially it's to find the best or the settings. Okay, if he's talking about choke opening, about gas lift, about number of wells, is or uh, subsea layout is to find out those that give better or the best. Okay, optimization usually means looking for the best. Okay, and it doesn't have to be only production, but on the second point here, we have that it can be any um, key performance indicator. Can be revenue, can be I want to minimize water production, I want to maximize gas, I want to maxi maxi maximize condensate. So it's some um, key performance indicator. Okay, one's one KPI. And that's what we are going to focus now on this part. Uh, I just want you to, I just wanted to make you aware of all the other issues, but we are going to focus on in this lecture on this part. Yeah. So first, something about time scales that we have. So we have uh, long term that we are talking about years and months. Short term is daily and weekly, and then shorter term, I call it shorter term. It's uh, seconds and minutes and hours. Okay, just if if our problem that we are trying to solve this uh, to maximize something or minimize something or optimize something, it's it, within these scales we classify it differently. Okay. So the first thing is that we have let me just. We have a physical system okay. and we have some input to that system which is typically the settings. Okay, so it, it call it control variables or okay. or I call it let's put control in quote marks, but essentially a variable that I can modify, okay, that I can change. And here I have an output okay of that system that actually is something that I measure. I use an instrumentation and that's why the instrumentation is important and then I say measured uh, variables. Okay, it doesn't have to be necessarily, doesn't have to be output, but it's... Um, okay. So the whole intention of optimization is that I want to change this guy up here Okay, until I maximize something, some measure value. Either a measure value like oil production, or with this variable I make a calculation and for example I compute revenue. Okay. The thing is that to do that I need, we will see now, I need the method that requires a lot of iterations. Okay, I have to make multiple changes here until I start to reach and in my view that I either I'm not able to do it, okay, or that it will be simply dangerous to change this, uh, this, this, this variable. So what I do, I create a model. Okay. It can be any model, usually it can be something based on physics, mechanistic, it can be a database model, can be um, all sorts of model, but something that represents, I assume that it represents my physical system. Okay. I, again, I have, depending on the control variables, Okay, but now I, I'm going to put here to distinguish between them, I have also, maybe let's put it on the side, I have also a system parameters. Hmm. 
Okay. Like for example, if we're talking about the reservoir model, that will be my distribution of porosity, permeability is not a variable, okay, but it's simply the, the parameters, the characteristics of, of the system. Okay, and here I have a model output. But our intention is that we want to make optimization on this model because we cannot touch or we cannot um, use our optimization algorithms on this on the real physical system in the for the most general case. We are going to see now there are a family where I can do this. Okay? But essentially I cannot change the input, see how it behaves. Okay, that will be either impractical, not possible, non-desirable or uh, simply will be not not permitted. Okay. So I have this model, which is, I, I'm saying fidelity, which has to be representative, which has to predict which within a reasonable range, my original system. Okay. And then I could apply uh, optimization on this model. So first let's talk about one thing which is crucial to optimization is this fidelity uh, case in which I I have what I call um, let me change the color an assimilation algorithm okay. that takes in the measure var variables and the output the output of the model. takes out these variables, takes out the model variables, and then it tries to adjust, typically it tries to adjust these, um, these system parameters. Okay, that are unknown. Maybe not all of them, some of them I know very well what they are, and they don't need to be changed. Like for example, tubing size is something I know how much it is. But, for example, for other things that might be highly uncertain, I try to change it until... Um, okay, system, let, let's not call it system, but let's call it model parameters. Okay. Because it could be something that is uncertain, like reservoir model can be porosity, can be permeability, okay? But it could also be the simply the the model. Like um, if we talk about pressure drop in pipe for multiphase flow, you typically those models are very uh, uh, they don't have a good predictability. So you have to change, you have to make some tuning in the system to be able to reproduce your your behavior okay like for example the pressure delta p uh, you might want to adjust the delta p friction or the delta p hydrostatic to get a good match okay so it's model and let's let's put here so, so here system so you remember okay and essentially after that is in place okay and, and by the way this in reservoir simulator will be a history matching okay i'm trying to do some sort of history matching and then after I have that, I let me just copy this figure because here is fidelity. Keep okay. After I, I go to the next step, which is optimization, which is essentially have. Let's make another box. in which I take this control variables okay I write those control variables okay and then I read the output okay. make it a bit nicer okay. 
Okay, so the optimizer is in charge of of um, change back to mouse. Okay, um, yeah, now it came back. So, uh, so the optimizer is simply reading, for example, oil production, and then it's trying to change these control variables, okay, such that they uh, they maximize, okay, and they are said maximize, you typically maximize or minimize, okay. So this this part we call it optimization loop. And this part we call it assimilation loop. Okay. So another thing is that there is the models that we're discussing inside here. I have spoken about it like if it's a reservoir model or if it's a well model or if it's a network model. But essentially, I have to see what output variables I'm interested in and how to get that output variable. You can sometimes, it's not simply the, if it's revenue, for example, it's not simply the output of one model, but actually have to chain or I have to connect different models together. Okay, For revenue, I might need the reservoir, the wells, the network. And after that, I need the sales system. Let's say if I'm calculating some sort of NPV or I need the oil price. Okay, So this model essentially can be either one model or can be a chain of interconnected models. Okay, that's what this and this abbreviation IAM, something you should be familiar, uh, should be aware, is integrated asset modeling. Okay, I have essentially different models in my production systems. I have economic calculator, processing facilities, for example, the condensate typically depends on the processing facilities, the amount of LNG, so I need to connect that to know how much gas and oil and water I'm producing. I need a reservoir simulator to know how much if they are able to flow through the pipe. I need uh, some well and surface simulator. So I need to connect all of these okay, to, to obtain my objective. Some things here I'm going to write are uh, consistency. And that's something we have to be careful. For example, the fluid description that I'm using should be consistent between all of these models. Okay, and, and it's sometimes challenging because, for example, in reservoir simulator, I'm using black oil tables, while in HISIS, I'm using an equation of state, AUS. Okay, and Prosper and GAP, I sometimes use compositional, sometimes I use uh, black oil. Okay, so consistency has to be uh, important. Okay, I also want to say a coupling. Okay, we, for example, HISIS, as I told you, has, or the top side has a constant, typically is maintained at a constant separator pressure. So that means that constant, that controller that I have, decouples the two systems. So I need, of course, how much rates are coming in to know how many rates are coming out, okay, how much rates are coming out, how, how, the amounts that are coming out, okay, but they are decoupled, so I don't that pressure won't change during the life of the field. So I simply can run these guys separately in time and then post compute all the rates in time in HISIS to see how much they are, they are going to be. Okay, while I cannot do that typically when I have, for example, a reservoir and a network model. Because the bottom hole pressure or the wellhead pressure I specify in the model, it depends on the pressure drop of, of uh, the flow lines and, and wells. Okay, so in that case, I have to be uh, careful with, with uh, coupling. Okay. okay, and also another thing is this is a kind of a black box scenario where uh, typically I don't know exactly how the model works inside. These are provided by different vendors, okay, all of these tools, and I actually don't have 
uh, I they give some documentation they tell you explain to you how it is done but essentially these are like they behave like black box okay it's not that I can if I need to make any change here to make it more compatible with this guy here I could do it straightforward okay they are like a separate unit a black box where I have an input and then I have this black box then I have an output I have to treat it like a unit in that part in which I cannot go inside and see what's happening in there. Okay. So going back to our production optimization, we say we have uh, these three scales. Okay, And long term, it refers to essentially I have a transient model, okay, like a reservoir model. And the models are highly uncertain because like a uh, reservoir model, you might imagine initially have very few data to history match to, to try to find out what are the right physical parameters of my system. And when time progresses, I have more and more data and I can be more certain, more sure of I can reduce the uncertainty on some of the parameters that give me the, the observed uh, behavior. But as I mentioned, because in uh, I I need like I need to integrate, for example, to get revenue, to be able to find realistic rates. I need to integrate it somehow with other models. So typically, I use integrated asset modeling. Okay. Short term, uh, we are talking daily, weekly, and there is data to tune these models. It doesn't mean that that's done, but it, there is data available to tune the models, and the models are typically. A steady state, uh, like in a network, a well processing plant, and I try to optimize, let's say in the matter of days, maybe even two hours, but not that common, days or weeks. Okay. And then shorter term, uh, uh, the question is, can we use uh, steady state models or do we need transient for some problems? I need to use a transit model. For some problems, I can use a steady state model. And then also, because of the methods we are going to see later, and there is a question also, why to use models at all? At all? We can simply deploy my, my optimization scheme directly on the actual system. Okay, some, some examples that you have in long term, you want to maximize recovery factor, you want to maximize uh, NPV, you want to reduce water cut and GOR. Typical control variables is, for example, the placement of the wells, the well rates, okay, with time, the well status, if it's a shut in or if it's producing, well routing, um, you know, to which separator to produce, to which facility to produce, and the presence of equipment. If I have some, uh, for example, subsea processing, I have a pump, or if the ICD, if I if if I need to have some inflow control device in the well board to control the inflow from different zones, okay, might be many other things uh, here, but these are some examples. Short term, maximize oil production, condensate production, gas production, and revenue. Okay, typically it's not an NPV, no, it's not a discounted number, but it's revenue for a given point in time. And the question, sometimes the question is how to allocate a scarce resource. If I have limited gas injection, I have limited power. <clears throat> and variables are choke opening, gas leaf rates, pump frequency, well routing, etc. Okay. Shorter term is to maximize production revenue also. But in this case, if it's a transient phenomena, I want to mitigate and reduce the fluctuations. Okay? Some typical uh, variables are things that I can change within a, um, a um, kind of a short time frame. Okay? Like uh, here is not really choke. I should maybe we are going to see choke relatively something that takes a slower is kind of a slow. Uh, response okay so a control valve okay opening uh, gas leaf rate uh, pump frequency okay so just to jump right into it I'm going to go through some examples we are not going to do any optimization yet but we are going to use is like a brute force approach okay we are going to first look at the function we're interested in what is that objective function and we are going to try to 
plotted as a function of the input or the adjustable variables. Okay, and we're going to see how it looks like and where is this maximum located, okay, or minimum located. Okay, so we start with a classical example, and this is a short-term optimization problem, and this is two standalone gas lifted wells. Um, but let, let's talk first a bit about gas lift. Okay, so I'm going to put a bottom packer. Ended up being too big this tubing, and then I have Okay, so let's make just Yeah, I'm not sure if all of you are aware of the gas lift of the gas lift performance of wells, but we are just going to repeat it here for clarity's sake. So here we have a um and let's make it in red because gas gas is usually in red. Okay, Q gas injection. And we're getting some oil from the formation that we're going to make in green. Q oil from the reservoir. Okay, let's call it Q oil reservoir. And all of these rates, they are, remember, a standard condition rate. So as I mentioned, um, let's make the delta P in the tubing. Okay, Gas injection, essentially the gas will go through here enter through this valve and then it will mix with the stream okay so that's essentially what gas lift is doing i i uh, inject gas through the annulus okay then i reach um uh, uh, mandrel okay a gas lift mandrel uh, a gas lift valve that it allows it to go from one from the outside to the inside okay and then it goes goes through the flow okay so what is the intention here you know that uh, the delta P in the tubing essentially has two dominating components, delta P hydrostatic plus delta P friction. Okay, The delta P hydro hydrostatic, okay, it's um, some density of the mixture times this G. It's it's like it depends on this uh, on, on these two. Okay, it depends on the density or it's a mass. So you have a uh, you have to have the length, you have to have the the volume. But essentially, it's uh, density of the mixture and the and the uh, gravitational acceleration. Okay, so when I add more gas, okay, when I inject gas into the stream, and and just be aware, this delta P is the pressure between P W F and PWH. Okay. PWF minus PWH. Okay. So when I increase the amount of gas, this density when uh, Q gas injection increases, there are two things that happen. This density of the mixture is actually becoming closer to the density of the gas. Okay, but there is also another thing you remember here we have this delta P friction has its velocity squared. Okay, and this velocity is the local rate of if we're going to make a simplified model of oil plus the local rate of gas, okay, divided by the cross section of the pipe squared. Right? So if we increase that rate that we are injecting, okay. That means that this guy is going down, okay? This component is going down. So we say here, let me write that down. Delta P hydrostatic is going down, okay? But at the same time, this guy, the delta P friction 
is actually going up. Okay, so you have two competing effects. One of them, you're reducing this delta P, but you're also increasing this delta P because now you're having more and more gas okay, all inside circulating through the tubing. Remember, what I care here for this delta P of the tubing is just the rate that is going through here. Okay. So these effects cause a very strange uh, or a very interesting behavior. And that is if I plot, let's say in this case, which I have a very close to the separator, a well, single well, very close to the separator, and I plot the Q oil rate. Okay, let's put the bar just to make sure Q gas injection. Okay, we will see initially this guy. So first we have the point where we have no simply zero, okay, no injection. And it might be the well is not even producing at that, but let's say in this case it is. Okay? In this case, if we don't inject any gas, we will be producing some oil. Okay? Then when you start injecting, what this guy is going to be reduced, okay, and dramatically. But this guy, the, the frictional component, still doesn't increase that much. Okay, so therefore the delta P in the tubing is total is reduced. Okay, so let's say when you're using this value here. So you get an increase, a total increase of oil rate from the reservoir. Okay. So in this point here, the reduction in delta T hydrostatic is bigger okay, than the increase in friction. Okay, let me just change the color so there won't be any confusion. This point here, okay, that's what happens. The increase, the decrease in delta P is bigger than the increase in friction. So it's, it starts to go up. Okay, and that will continue like that okay, if we have another point and another point, okay, until at some point this guy starts to become significant. Okay, and it starts to overpower or starts to be bigger than the friction loss. Okay, and then it starts to go down. Okay, so in this area here, let me. This area to the right, the actual the delta P friction increase is bigger than the delta P hydrostatic reduction okay and that's why you have this peak okay and this peak is something that that's what we where we want to be right we want to find out if in terms of optimization of this system we want to produce for example the maximum oil rate possible and we want to find what is this setting okay we don't care too much what is this value but we care very much about how much is this Q gas injection star okay, this setting okay so that's our problem we have two of these wells and um, uh, and we want to optimize a system with two wells okay so let's let's make another drawing here okay where we have two wells and they are going to be each one of them is going to be with producing to their own separator, okay, or no, maybe not their own, but they have one big manifold that it's, it is so close that essentially it's like they were independent from each other. Okay. We should put, uh, to make it nicer. Okay, so we have well one and well two. The way we know is that we have the curve from before. Okay, we uh, somehow, um, okay, we have well one, well two. Okay, and for each well separately, we have measured this Q oil reservoir one, 
versus Q gas injection one. Okay, and it gives me a curve like this. Either by model or I did some measurements in the field. And then also I have this um, Okay, might be producing from the same reservoir or from different reservoir, doesn't matter for our example. And essentially this curve, we're going to model this curve has a polynomial. Okay, let's say we produce it either with Prosper, you produce it with your own code, um, um, you measure it, okay, you might have a few points that you measure and we represent that curve, we make a fitting and we fit it to a curve that is QO and it will be the same for both, the only thing that would change is the coefficient okay, will be A to QG injection to the fourth plus B Q G injection to the three plus C Q G two plus E. Okay, and E will be simply this point here. This is E. So that's the model we are using, assuming that they were measured from before, and then the main task is to say when When is Q oil total? Okay, that means Q oil reservoir one, Q no reservoir one, well one, oil from the reservoir from well two, okay, maximum. Okay, and then the next point is to say at which Q gas injection one and Q gas injection two. Okay. And what if there is a constraint? Okay, that we are going to discuss a bit later, but what if there is a constraint on gas available? Okay, that means that Q gas injection total okay, is, is constrained somehow. That means that the sum of this, of this uh, Q gas injection 1, Q gas injection 2 okay, has to be less than that Q gas injection total. So the approach we're going to follow, okay, is like if, um, so let's see, how do we, uh, do we make it? Okay, the approach we're going to follow our function, we have Q oil total, which is Q oil of well one, that is a function of only, and here is something that the variables, they are each fun the function it can be expressed as a sum of two functions okay q injection one plus q oil of well two q gas injection two okay it's not that the gas injection affects the production of the other of one affects two okay they are completely separate so it's a separable function this function is a function of of you know, of, of two separate functions. Okay, and that means that this Q oil total is a function of these two variables, this Q gas injection one and Q gas injection two. Right? So it's like we had said, we have X and we have Y. Right? And this is the one that we want to maximize. And we want to find the values of x and y 
and y star that maximize this this set okay so one approach that we are going to follow and we're going to do it in python jupyter it's uh we are going to plot this function z versus x and y okay but we know that they cannot have any number so x can be from zero to sorry this is uh, wrong Good that hope no mathematician is looking at this lecture so you have x and y okay so you know that the gas injection can be post has to be positive and we don't know yet the upper bound okay but we we are going to look at the numbers i have soon okay also the y1 so i'm going to the approach is i'm going to take first make a few points okay in 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 y and in x okay? and then i'm going to make each combination of all of these points i'm going to create some sort of a grid okay these two then these two then these two and these two that will be my these points right and then i continue with these points okay so i make each the element wise combination of these to create a grid okay to be able to plot it and this is the brute force approach because i don't know we are going to see later but in a multi-dimensional problem we cannot do this trick okay it will be just too many points it will be it will increase dramatically to explore all the space of possible combinations but in this case we have a two variable system so therefore i can i can simply i can do it right so i have this and then i have one grid like that so i'm going to test all of those combinations the way i'm going to do it i have for q gas injection one I have a vector okay. for Q gas injection two I also have a vector okay that start on zero and then and then I have to do the element wise combination of each one of them I have to combine the first 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 second uh, first third and so forth and then second first second and that will give me all of this grid okay so let's let's write that here element wise combination of all okay it's simply for 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 plotting when you plot it on a program you don't think really too much about um you know you simply provide matlab with or python with the x and y and z and that's it but i just want you to think of it like you're sampling okay this is samples of a set okay in this case is the total oil from the reservoir and then this for all of them combination of all that's the first step and then the second step, evaluate set, okay, QO total for all these combinations. Okay, so I have to come and each one of them I have to go and evaluate set, okay. And I don't know what I'm going to find, but you saw that. Uh, in the previous slide we have a peak like that so we should expect to have something like that with a maximum right because that's that's how it but in, in general we cannot do that but simply we evaluate the function at all of these points okay. that might give me a um, I'm going to make a mess here but that might give me a okay, a geometry like that Okay, so an approach because we are um, human beings are not very good at looking at detecting 
because it depends on the angle, right? They're looking at the plot like that. So it depends how you look at it, the rotation, etc. So what we're going to make, we're going to use a color map. Make a color map. Okay, and it's like I was looking it from above. Okay, I'm looking at this from above. So I make X and Y, right? And then I have all of these combinations okay, in my X and Y. So I'm going to make a color bar here. Okay, is a color scale. Not color sale, but color scale. Okay, where and that scale is going to be four Q O total. Okay, and for example, I assign here. You are going to see now, but this might be like black, and this might be uh, yellow. So I'm going to assign, depending on the value of each point, a color. Okay, so for example, if this is low, then I, I assign it, uh, let's, let's try to make it, uh, if it's low, then I assign it, for example, purple. If it's, uh, now it's a bit bigger, then I, I assign it blue. Okay, then if it's um, very big, then I assign it yellow. That means there is some sort of a maximum there. Okay. Then if it's high but not that high, I assign it this this one. So you end up, if you make this for a lot of points, you end up with okay, if, if you if you do it for a few points, let's let's go back, sorry. Let me just make a box around it. Okay, these are all the boxes where my points are. Okay, so then I feel I need these are my points. Okay, these are all the points, they are in the center of this box. all of these combinations. So simply I fill each one of these box with the color scale that represents the value that it has. Okay, like let's say for example this one will be here. Then you have around it something like this. Okay, maybe some Okay, then you have even or more around it, you have something like this. Okay. And then very far away, let's say for low rates, then you're going to get maybe this. Uh, I mean, we are going to see now how it's going to look like, but it's simply to tell you how do we generate this plot. Okay, so instead of looking at it like a 3D, chart which is nice you we're going to look at it as a color map okay and the color map means i for each combination i plot the value the result of the function i x and y i calculate the function and then i assign it a, a color and then i simply plot the color put the color on the box okay so let's uh, go to 